Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi. Can you guys hear me? Oh, yeah. All right. So I'm Natasha. I'm an alcoholic. I'm hi. I'm super honored to be here tonight, and I'm glad there's so many people here. Um, like I really am. I love this room, and I love Alcoholics Anonymous. And this is such an honor to be able to speak to you guys because I'm talking about like a deadly disease that you know I was going to die from, and I get to be alive today, and I get to stand here and carry a message to tell you how that happened, and hope that someone else can hear that message, and possibly have a little bit of hope. You know, so. All right, so I have to say what it was like, what happened, and what it's like now. And so it shouldn't be too hard since it's like my story. I don't have to make anything up here. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> maybe I will. I don't know. But I usually catch myself when I make up something and I'm like, oh, wait a second. That didn't happen. That's an absolute lie. <laughs> but um, it, that happens. And sometimes I catch it days later. But well, <laughs> anyways, good luck. <laughs> so I um, was born in San Francisco, California. I won't tell you, like, from, like, when I was walking to, like, crawling or anything like that, but I'm going to just tell you that I was born there, you know. Um, I moved around, like, six or seven times before I was 13 years old. You know, my my mom, when I was four years old, my grandpa died, and I was in San Francisco, and my mom took me back to New Jersey. That was the last time I ever saw my dad, and my mom, you know, succumbed to mental illness, or at least that's when I couldn't realize, you know, that's probably when that happened. So, you know, I had another few other traumas happen, like a couple of times I was molested as a, like a four-year-old and I just kind of, um, I kind of just brushed that stuff aside, you know, and I, and I always felt responsible for my mother's happiness and I was talked to like I was an adult. And so I felt really separate from everyone and I was given a lot of like adult, you know, information and, and I love my mother so much, you know, but I mean, I was raised by someone who has mental illness and I have mental illness today, but I'll get to that later. <laughs> and, um, so basically what happened was I had a lot of trauma, you know, and I, I don't, that doesn't make me an alcoholic because I've you know, heard people say they've had no trauma, you know, and they're alcoholic. So, I mean, it definitely didn't help my cause, but I was, uh, when I got to New Jersey, I was preoccupied with my weight from like elementary school and I was a little bit chubby and it was like. I was aware of it. And then one time when I was talking to my dad from San Francisco on the phone, I think he thought my mom was listening and he said, I hope you're not getting fat like your mom. And like, I was like 10 and I was like, I looked down and I was like, I saw like a little pudgy belly and I was like, oh my God, I am, you know? And uh, like my life changed at that moment. <laughs> but, and it's, it's sad because like I was tortured from an eating disorder for like 30 years of my life. I know I look like I'm 20, sorry. <laughs> 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 but anyways, um, yeah, no, I've, I've been through a lot. I don't know, you know, but, um, yeah. So, I mean, I, I, I was aware of my body and I was very, um, preoccupied with it. I was like, oh my God, you know, the next time I see my dad, I don't want him to, you know, have, have him see that I am fat like my mom, which, you know, wasn't the truth, but as a little girl, that's what I heard. So I never even saw my dad again anyway. So, you know, there goes that, um, not that that was a good thing, but <laughs> anyways, um, so what happened then? Like some other, you know, pretty much that's the trauma. I'm just going to like, you know, kind of breeze through that little girl, miserable, you know, feels not a part of, wants to be a part of, I want to wear the cute outfits. I want to like, you know, talk to boys. And so I end up moving again to finally Arizona, a couple times moved there. And then I ended up, oh, and that's where my bulimia started because this whole time I'm tortured about like how I look and how people will see me. And I don't want anyone to see that I'm fat. And I was just a little bit overweight, <laughs> but it was like a problem in my mind and I didn't want people to see me, but I wanted to know people, you know, so I, I just didn't know how to connect to anyone because I wasn't taught how to relate to people like a normal person. You know, a lot, my mom was a lot of like paranoia, a lot of, um, she loved me and we did a lot of fun stuff, but I did not get any communication skills. <laughs> I didn't get, you know, explanations of how the world works or why I never saw my dad again. I was too afraid to ask her. So I never asked, um, yeah, there was a lot of things that I didn't ask because I felt responsible for her, you know, not being sad. So, and she was still sad anyways, <laughs> but, um, and then I made her sadder, you know, as I, as I progressed through my alcoholism. But so I'm end up in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and I 
don't want to stay in the drunk log too long. Well, this is before that. This is just like, you know, leading up to it, why I really needed a drink at the age of 13. <laughs> so uh, thank, I mean, thank God for alcohol because I was dying. I was tortured in my mind, you know, and looking back when I first came into the rooms, I didn't think my child, I didn't think I, that was that big of a deal. I'm like, oh, it's fine. You know, everything was good. You know, my mom did the best she could, blah, blah, blah. But no, you know, a longer in sobriety, I've come to realize that, you know, I was pretty effed up, you know, and I didn't really have, you know, much of a chance. But, um, so basically New Mexico. Yeah. So, oh yeah, right before that, Arizona, 12 years old, miserable, start throwing up my food. And uh, for a 12 year old to throw up their food, they have to be in a lot of pain. You know, I kind of just used to look back at that and say, oh yeah, I started my bulimia when I was 12, you know, but that's not normal. <laughs> and, uh, it progressed, you know? And, um, so anyways, then I had my first drink the next year, 13, we just moved to Albuquerque, New Mexico. And that's where all of my drinking was done with a small, you know, little stint out here in California before I got sober. And so I drank for 10 years in Albuquerque. I drank, and I remember my first drink and I, you know, how everyone's like, Oh, it was so amazing. Like I didn't have that experience. You know, I liked it. I got a little dizzy, but I continued to drink, you know, I didn't end up, um, the first drink was, it was cool. You know, I finally felt a little bit of peace. You know, it gave me something you know, enough where I wanted to continue drinking it, even though vodka did not taste good at first. And <laughs> so it's, you know, so anyways, I continue to drink and vodka is like my favorite because it gets me blacked out the quickest. And that's all I wanted to do. <laughs> like I didn't want to drink socially. I kind of wanted to connect with people, but really what I really wanted to do in order for me to connect with you or to connect with anyone else, I had to forget who I was. I had to forget how I felt. I had to forget how I thought I looked. And I thought that when I drank that I became the person, you know, that I was really meant to be and I could be myself and I could open up without reserve, you know, and the only way I was gonna be able to talk to a guy was definitely drunk. And um, that worked in their favor, but not so much in mine. <laughs> Anyways, yeah, let's just get past that part. So yeah. <laughs> So yeah, I'm in, I'm in, I'm in high school. I'm drinking, you know, I become a blackout drinker and from the beginning, the drinking was not normal. And I, I was known as like the drunk and I was funny. Oh, Natasha's blacked out. She talks trash. She's so funny. And she's the alcoholic. And I thought it was funny to be an alcoholic. You know, I'm finally a part of, you know, I've kind of arrived on the scene. I finally feel a little bit at peace, you know, and I was never going to use drugs. Like that was bad. I just smoked pot at the time. <laughs> so anyways, and I, didn't, I guess that's a drug too, right? But, um, at that time I was sure like drugs are bad. I'm not going to do that. Like someone offered me cocaine in high school and I was like, oh my God, I can't believe she does cocaine. <laughs> like she's on my softball team. I was horrified. <laughs> so anyways, yeah. so I didn't have too many consequences in high school, except for I was just really uncomfortable. Like still couldn't talk to men or boys at that time. Still couldn't like get up and ask questions. Just like fear ridden, you know, fear driven. And at home I have this mom who's, who loves me, but it's like not really a stable environment. And I should mention at the age of 13, my mother met my stepdad, who was a raging alcoholic, and he just moved into our house. So his name is John. So I, now I have Daddy John, 13. You know, if I wasn't going to be an alcoholic, like, that fucking sealed the deal, you know? <laughs> so Daddy John is on the scene. He refers to me as the baby, and I'm very angry at this point. I'm very angry. I'm a 13-year-old, and I do not want to be referred to as the baby. <laughs> you know, is the baby coming with us? And so this raging alcoholic, you know, is throwing vacuums through our kitchen or living room window and breaking the truck so my mom can't leave and like all this chaos is ensuing, you know, while I'm in high school and, you know, it doesn't help my cause. <laughs> Basically I'm checking out, I, I'm going out, I'm drinking as often as I can, you know, and I don't know why I'm doing this. I have no idea. I have no idea. I have a problem. I just know that when I go out and I drink, I feel better and, and I, and I could have some friends and be a part of something. Um, and whenever I was sober, I was, you know, preoccupied with my weight, I was preoccupied with my life. And I thought, I didn't know how to live life. I didn't know how to communicate. And so I, when I was 16, they had my baby brother, John, also, little John. And <laughs> I don't know if I really call him that. I don't think I do. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so, <laughs> so that was a lie, right? Okay. <laughs> Can I say? I don't deny that um, that's part of my story. <laughs> but uh, so he comes on the scene, and I'm 16, Daddy John stops drinking at this point, cold turkey, so he's now a dry drunk. Perfect. I don't want I don't want Daddy John and my little baby brother and my mom showing up at my softball games. I'm humiliated. I'm already embarrassed to just be myself and be alive and like walking in public and I don't want this like 
entourage of like dysfunction like following me and sitting in the stands you know <laughs> like just calling attention to me and like daddy john like yeah and plus i didn't have a dad and i didn't know how to relate to anyone so even when john got sober like i still didn't know how to connect with him and i felt this tie to my mother so when she talked bad about him i had to always stay on her side because i was an extension of her i wasn't like a child <laughs> i was just you know on her team and we were against everyone basically <laughs> but um so Progression, yeah, 10 years of drinking. So I get out of high school. Uh, John's still sober. My mom's still mentally ill. We'll use that word. And I'm still mentally ill as well, you know, drinking progressively, you know, blacking out. But I never drove drunk. I would always have some – I was very responsible. Like, I'd have my friends drive my car in high school. Fast forward, I get into um, University of New Mexico. I have a full-ride scholarship. I'm not, like, a genius or anything. They only require that you have, like, a 2.5 GPA. I think they really wanted people in New Mexico to go to college and do something besides drink. But um, I had that opportunity, but I didn't know what to do with it. I did not know um, – I didn't know the importance of things. I kind of had this idea that I was going to go to school. I was going to become a doctor. I'm going to have a family. I'm going to be successful, and I'm going to take care of my mom. That was my goal. That was my job. I was supposed to make money to take care of my mom. And um, so I didn't. <laughs> I ended up drinking, and then I was like, oh, drugs like this guy was doing. I'm like, well, I guess they're not that bad, <laughs> you know, so that became a part of my story. And so I drank and drank and progressed, I guess, in my drinking. I was now driving drunk almost all the time. I was very lucky. I was, you know, crashed into curbs and woke up at the last minute near a bridge. Like I could just go on with like the, the, the close calls. I had a drive by shooting. Albuquerque's pretty ghetto. So it's not that hard to have a drive by shooting. Something to do with like a crack deal gone wrong with my roommate or something. So, so the, I'll just tell you the story. So the guy shows up at the door who was, you know, giving her the, I don't know what happened. And I'm probably talking trash to him because I'm in a blackout. And then later on, you know, for no reason at all, I'm past that on the couch. There's a drive-by shooting. And so the, I wake up and there's like a stretcher next to me. And I'm like, I already know by this time that stretchers are very expensive. Ambulance rides are very expensive. So I'm like, don't touch me. <laughs> and then they're like, do you know what just happened? And I'm like, what? They tell me, you know, you drive by shooting. And I'm like, okay, well, don't touch me. I'm, do we have to check your vitals? I'm like, I'm very vital. You know, like, I'm good. <laughs> just. And I go straight to the table and have a bottle of vodka. And I start drinking it in front of them. And I don't know what that means, but it means that I don't drink like a normal person. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, that should be an indication that I have a problem. But still, yeah, you know, I'm not convinced. Or even if I was convinced, I couldn't even stop because I don't think by this time I even tried to stop yet. And so, you know, obviously I have to go back home because I can't live there. I told the landlord, I'm like, this is horrific. I can't live here. I can't pay the rent that's past due. I just have to go back home. This is scary, you know. So I leave there, go back home, and I had some other traumas happen, like someone beat the crap out of me, like a bouncer, a female bouncer at a bar because I was talking trash. And she just, like, pummeled me and, like, broke my collarbone, blah, blah, blah. And I tried to go to court. It was just a mess, just, like, a bunch of, like, something that an 18, 19-year-old really shouldn't be having to deal with. But I was, you know, I couldn't control my consumption of alcohol. And it led me to these, um, <laughs> these, these places. And so I still, I think around this time I started having consequences. Oh, yeah, passed it on the street. Ended up in the hospital. They're, like, handing me AA pamphlets. And I'm still not sure if I'm an alcoholic. But I did get handed a lot of little flyers that suggested I go to Alcoholics Anonymous and other treatment centers. Um, but I was mainly concerned with just making sure I still had alcohol and still had other stuff, you know, to get me, to get me through. So two more minutes of my drunk log. <laughs> so anyways, it's not that long, but, um, <laughs> it's more interesting in sobriety. <laughs> so, um, anyways, yeah. So let me tell you, I just, um, I couldn't control my drinking. You know, I was having these consequences. I, I went to an AA meeting. I started going to like a a group, and I mean, I should mention, like, cops are coming to my house because I was threatening suicide, and it wasn't, it wasn't pretty. My little brother was seeing me drunk and getting picked up, you know, from random places when mom and John had to come get me, you know, and, and I just wanted to be a good sister, you know, I wanted to be a good daughter, I wanted to be a good student, but none of those were options for me because I could not, I could not control my drinking once I started, you know, and I, I find out later that I couldn't stay stopped either. That was part of it. And because, I mean, if I didn't start, there wouldn't be a problem, right? So apparently there's a problem in my mind. But, um, so, you know, fast forward, all this crap is happening. So I don't want to forget anything good from that time. I don't think there is, I don't think there is anything good. So anyways, um, just more hospitalizations. But, oh yeah, yeah. That's the part I wanted to tell you guys. Like I actually did try to quit drinking one time. That was like a January and I was like, okay, I'm going to do this. You know, I'll, I'll try and quit drinking. And that was when I realized, I think it was 20 or 21 and I just, I really, that's like the moment I realized like I couldn't stop and I was like. 
terrified, like just for a moment though, but then I continued drinking and everything was fine. <laughs> I was like, oh, I don't really need to stop anyways, you know, <laughs> why was I worried? <laughs> so, um, you know, it was a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of just drinking over and over again, promising myself I won't drink the next day, I won't drink the next day, but always stopping at the liquor store. I was, you know, um, working at restaurants at this time and that, you know, career, I don't know what you'd call it, was not, it was very conducive to my alcoholism. It, I fit in well there, although I was like the worst were on one, and I had nicknames that were not nice. So <laughs> anyways, um, let's see. So fast forward, drinking, 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 can't stop, you know, realize I can't stop. That sucks. I was walking back to my um, apartment one day before the drive-by, before I got, you know, kicked out slash moved because it wasn't safe. <laughs> um, I... I was walking back to my car and I realized like I'm smoking, I'm drinking. And I was like, and I was like 22 at the time. I was like, this has to stop. I was like, I, I, this has to stop. I have to stop drinking. I have to stop smoking before my whole life is over, you know? And then I was like, but not right now, not yet. You know, I still have a little bit of time. <laughs> I still have a little bit of time. So the truth is, is that I couldn't even if I wanted to, because who would live that life? You know, I wasn't making a choice but I thought I was, I, you know, I didn't know what I was suffering from. I didn't know that I didn't have a choice in the matter because it seems like I'm making a choice. I feel uncomfortable. I get some beer. I feel comfortable. I go out, I drink, have the severe consequences, blah, blah, blah. And then it looks like I'm making the choice over and over again, but I really have no choice. Like my mind is always taking me to that liquor store. And like, I come to learn like later what's driving that, you know, it wasn't like the, all the trauma that I experienced as a child. It was actually this internal condition. Maybe some of that contributed to it, but I have this like this internal condition, which is like super uncomfortable. You know, it was definitely exacerbated by like the fun stuff I went through as younger, but I just, I just can't seem to like, to make it feel any better, you know, and I don't have a solution. I don't, I don't have an outlet. And so that drives this mind that tells me I need something to be okay. Like I need something to get some relief. And so I was using, you know, food obviously, and that didn't really give me that much relief yet. So alcohol was still like the main contributor at this time. It gave me what I needed at the time, you know, it helped me to get through. So I can't stop drinking. I decide I'm going to move to California. And this is when I was 22. God, I'm hot. <sighs> and I'm, yeah. So anyways, uh, let's see. So 22, I decide I'm going to move to California. I'm looking at all of like these rental places where I'm going to live. And I don't really figure like how alcohol is going to fit into my life at this point. I'll tell you one time it was, I was on the computer and I saw this like studio. It had a blue, it was painted blue inside. And I just imagined myself like getting there and drinking a glass of red wine. It was by the beach. And it was, I think it was up in LA because that was my plan. I was going to go to Los Angeles and I was going to become an actress. Well, first I was going to lose a little weight once I got out here. <laughs> And then I was going to be an actress because that's how I needed to do it in my mind. So that was my plan. And I flew out. Or no, I didn't fly. It wasn't that fancy. I, um, <laughs> I, <laughs> I took a Greyhound and I packed up. <laughs> so, yeah. I packed up my snowboarding bag because my backup plan was Big Bear or something like that. But, you know, so I, 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 <laughs> I packed up my snowboarding bag with all of my clothes and all my stuff. And I told my mom I was just going out there for a month because I couldn't really tell them the truth that I wasn't happy here and I wanted to leave because I didn't even really know that. I kind of just wanted to get away so I could drink and finally be okay because, you know, California is where I'm going to be okay because that's where I was from and I miss the West Coast and it's sunny, blah, blah, blah. So I'm coming out here to be an actress, Greyhound, snowboarding bag meet someone I used to be in a restaurant job with and lived with, some other raging, um, I don't want to diagnose him, but he may possibly have been a drug addict, alcoholic, you know? <laughs> so I meet this person and, and my, my mom tells him, like, you have to not let her drink. She's on ant abuse. She cannot drink. And my mom's like a perfect codependent, you know, picking me up all the time, taking care of me, you know, anything she can do because she loves me so much. And like, honestly, as, a, as an Alan on her mom, like I wouldn't know how to do it any different either. If I wasn't in this program, you know, if I didn't know what the disease of alcoholism was, like, I would not know what to do. Like, who knows? Like, how do you, how are you supposed to know? You're supposed to like, you know, detach with love. Like, what is that? I don't, I, I wouldn't know. So she didn't know. Um, so I just remember this is like the only time I had one drink and I was at Lahaina's by the beach. And so I had to like pretend I wasn't going to overdrink. I'm like, I'm just going to have one beer. So there's this pitcher, pour a beer, and I'm just like sipping it like a normal person. And why do I remember that like 16 years later? Because like it was really uncomfortable. It was that uncomfortable. And so that didn't last very long. You know, I pretended to be normal for like an hour. It was rough. <laughs> so then I got back to this apartment that had a bar and then I was gone. And my debut in San Diego was I ended up on 1111 Island three days after getting out here, like passed out on a mat. 
and unfortunately, I don't think I was passed out. I'm pretty sure I was awake when I went in, so I was aware, kind of. But um, yeah, so that was my debut. And I continued to do that for the next few months I was out here. Nothing changed. Nothing was different. Mom was thinking I was dead, you know, calling people like, are you, are you still alive at one point? I'll get to that later. That was horrible. <laughs> so um, I finally end up like back on the mat again. And then I go to the 10 day program at this, you know, VOA Volunteers of America that was downtown. And I don't really know what's going on. I'm in detox. I'm looking around. The people are older. This one lady drinks a full, the big one. What's it called? No, not even the handle. The other one. I can't remember now. The 750 milliliter. Yeah. <laughs> okay. She drinks a whole one of those um, a, a day. And I was just like, God, that's a lot, you know? And I was thinking in my mind, like, I at least save like a, you know, a quarter in the bottom for the next morning, you know? So <laughs> like, like, <laughs> like I'm not as bad as her, you know? And I was really thinking this, like really. And so I'm not really sure if I'm an alcoholic. I'm sitting in detox, you know, and and I'm just not sure this is for me because how is this going to work for me? Like this room of strangers, some of them have like a few teeth, you know, and at that time I only had chipped teeth. I've gotten them fixed. <laughs> but I, um, but so, yeah, I'm not sure if I'm an alcoholic. Basically, I end up detox again, crawling on the floor, you know, hair was dyed blonde, black roots out to here, or this color roots, it looked black, you know, all matted from God knows what. And I was just like on a, a binge, you know, somewhere and I end up there. And I'm like, you know, I just was tired. I just wanted to rest. And the lady's name was, um, she's not an A. Okay, I can't say her name. <laughs> Anyways, she was a really loving lady who was at VOA. And she said, if I take you back to the detox side, you're going to have to go to crash. And that's like a county-funded treatment center that, like, people are usually court-ordered to. And I was not a fan of it. I actually declined it the first time because I had a way better idea. I actually went to Rachel's, and I lived above the post office for 30 days. And then I moved in with this guy I refer to as Creepy I won't say his name, creepy guy, and who I met at detox. And I was like, oh, he looks like he'll get me drunk. And so, yeah, I was, was right on, you know, it's not that hard to find someone to do that. And so that was my plan. You know, I didn't know. And then I was going with other people, making new friends. And so, and then I was dying, though. You know, I was dying. I was, I was blacking out. I almost got kidnapped. I don't even know what happened. I think I got away. <laughs> <laughs> I really do. I know I ran for the door. And then I kind of remember running in an alley, but it was, I, I don't know if that was another time. I honestly don't know what happened. But it was a really creepy situation. There was like their seven-year-old was like downstairs. Oh, it was gross. So, um, yeah. So obviously, like, I'm not drinking. I'm not very successful at this drinking thing. I'm, I'm like endangering my life. You know, I'm, I can't take care of myself. I can't um, do anything, basically. So she takes me into it. I said, okay, you know, I'm on the floor and I wanted to get in bed. So, and detox. And so I went to crash for four months. You know, I learned that I, I'm an alcoholic, possibly. And I didn't, I might have depression, but I didn't want to take any meds or go to see a psychiatrist or anything like that. Like, I'm good. I got it. And so I got out of there and then I continued to, I went to sober living and that lasted about, two weeks because I started forging my meeting slips and I was like one of the few people there that was there voluntarily. So I don't know why I felt like I had to forge my meeting slip. It's because I kind of knew deep down inside that I needed help, but I didn't know like what that help was. Like I didn't know like what to do or how to get it. I didn't know what I was suffering from. So I was hopeless. So basically my backup plan is always like, I know I'm going to drink again. And there might be some people in here that are like, I know I'm going to drink again. Like this is nice. This program offers a solution for other people, but like it's not going to work for me. Like I had too much stuff wrong with me and I knew I was going to drink again. So, I mean, if you know you're going to drink again, like the good news is, is that you might be alcoholic, you know, and like this program might work for you because if the mind keeps taking you back to like a, an alcohol problem where you can't stop, you know, those are two components of being an alcoholic. So there's only one more to, you know, diagnose yourself. And so I relapse, blah, blah, blah. Mom thinks I'm dead. Another trip to the psych ward, wake up, padded room, blah, blah, blah. So I'm in the drunk log a lot. Let me get out of there. So I finally go back to crash voluntarily. I'm like, please let me back in, you know? And so I go from the psych, the padded room to a hotel back to crash. And I'm so grateful for treatment centers. I'm so like happy when people from treatment centers come here. Um, crash saved my life. Like treatment saved my life. The police saved my life. Detox saved my life. Like I could not take care of my life and I could not stop drinking. So these this facility really saved my life. It didn't, you know, recover me, so I wouldn't ever drink again, but it kept me dry for four months, and it taught me that I, and I did finally get that outside help, and I, and I suffer from depression and anxiety, and so it was really important for me, like, I'm not promoting, like, but it, the book says, you know, if we need outside help, 
get it. You know what I mean? Like, so I needed it. And without, and finally, once I started treating my depression, like I felt a little more normal. Like I felt like, oh, this is how normal people feel. So it kind of gave me like a head start to like being, um, I'm sweating. So you can't, you can't tell, can you? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> okay. I'm going to drink some of this water. I pour it on my head. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so that'd be interesting. Um, <laughs> I've done worse, <laughs> no, but, um, yeah, so let's see, so basically, I forgot where I was now, yeah, yeah, mental health, obviously, I needed some help there, and, uh, so, I'm actually, I'm actually, this is me normal today, so. but, um, this is as good as it gets, basically, <laughs> so, I, um, you know, started treating the depression, and it gave me, like, the ability to, like, open up and kind of talk about, like, what was going on and I wasn't so afraid of people anymore and I went to sober living after this and I realized at this time even though I wanted to stop drinking I was still going to drink and I had no power choice or control I knew that my greatest desire to stop drinking and even to stop with my eating disorder I was like I can't do it I can't do it I have depression I have an eating disorder like I have all this debt I have this misery mind you I was 23 like what kind of problems is a 20 anyways so um I mean I look back now and I'm like I, anyways so um I didn't have a husband. I didn't have a kid. I didn't have any, like, bunch of crap that I accumulated in sobriety. <laughs> not, not, not that my kid is crap. <laughs> I mean, the, <laughs> I won't speak for the rest. <laughs> but anyways, I, <laughs> so, um, yeah, let's see. So sober. So I, so I get out and I go to sober living and I start working this program like my life depends upon it. Because it it does, you know, because I realized by now, like, I want to stop drinking. I, I still want to drink, but I, I also want to stop drinking. So I'm tortured and I'm uncomfortable. And all of the, like, horror and demoralization is all coming back to me. And, like, my family's over there and they're counting on me. And it's, like, all this. And I don't I don't have any power not to drink. So I'm pretty terrified. So I start going to meetings every day. And I, like, have this, like, five checklist that I do. I go to meetings. And so I was back into crash on December 16th of 2002. And that's my sobriety date. I just celebrated 15 years of sobriety. And thank God, you know, and thank, you know, thanks for this fellowship because I probably wouldn't be alive. And so that's why I'm like excited to always, you know, be here and to carry a message. So, um, cause I was pretty much hopeless and I, and I couldn't stop drinking. So, you know, I went to the meetings, I read this big book, you know, I got this sponsor. Actually, she got me, it was an accident. She's like, are you, are you asking me to be your sponsor? I was not. And she's like, I was like, yeah, cause I didn't. Yeah, anyway, so that happened. <laughs> Had a sponsor, started working on the steps with her. And I didn't know what I was doing. You know, I just made a little checklist. Like, yeah, I'm powerless. Yeah, I'm unmanageable. Like, when I drink, this happens. And when I'm sober, I can't control, like, the sunset, you know. And and it was it was a beginning. You know, I got to see that I didn't have as much – I don't know what I saw. I saw enough to stay sober for a while. And so I went through the steps. I got a little bit of clarity in my fourth step. And But I was still feeling horrible this whole time. I felt terrible. Like, I needed a drink so bad. Every night I was begging God, please take the obsession to drink. Please take it. I still couldn't talk to people. I was, um, I was crying all the time. Someone reminds me, like, I cried my whole first year. And because I suffered from, like, even though I was um, medicated for my depression, I still suffered, like, that spiritual <laughs> void and that we have, if you're an alcoholic and you stop drinking, <laughs> you might know what I'm talking about. <laughs> so I still had that, like, discomfort and that, like, void, and nothing fixed that up until this point, until unless it was alcohol or, you know, or anything else. And so nothing good, nothing healthy, illegal stuff. And so um, I just, I, yeah, I, I was just, I was just broken. I didn't know what to do except for just to go to a meeting every day. I got a job. I didn't want to work around alcohol. I did everything I could to not drink. You know, I stayed in sober living. I like said my little prayers and I didn't know what I was praying to. I didn't know what I was doing. And then I met with my sponsor and I worked my steps. And I remember after my fourth step, like, we went through some of the trauma stuff that I had went through. And she's like, yeah, and I got to see, okay, yeah, they're sick like me too, you know, and kind of got past it, just moved past it. But then, like, that comes up later on. Like, that was that was a good for a start from where I was at in my first year of sobriety. But I had to address that stuff later, you know, because it was starting to play out in my life, you know, because I, I needed outside help, basically. Because a lot of the traumas that happened to me were like, it was good that I had the steps to stay sober, but I also needed a little bit more help. And I didn't know that though. I just uh, went through the fourth step, went through the fifth step, still miserable. Like, this isn't going to work. I was actually waiting for my spiritual awakening. I'm like, when is this going to happen? This sucks. Like, I want my spiritual awakening. And um, 
so I started doing my amends and it's funny, like sometimes I think like people want the like spiritual awakening, like in the first step, you know, like if I got it in the first step, I wouldn't have to do the next 11, you know? So (laughs) I'm like, it's, you're going to be like miserable for a minute if you're like, like anything like me. So, I mean, that's what I utilized the fellowship for. And I didn't know at the time what I was doing or how I was staying sober, but basically bringing my body to the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous was carrying me through. It was giving me that ease and comfort that I used to get from a drink and only a drink. So that's what was happening. I found out like 10 years later how I was actually staying sober. I thought I had this like five checklist. I'm like, yeah, I just did these five things and it worked. But it's like, there's a, like the whole chapter, chapter five, how it works kind of tells me how it works. And that the book talks about like a fellowship and like the fellowship is good enough and it'll, it'll get me through, you know, the beginning days, but it's, there's like a warning about the fellowship if I'm just doing meetings and I wasn't, you know, getting in contact with some power that was going to actually give me power to show up and be sober. It wasn't going to last, you know, and that was my experience the first time. So I was like, okay, I'll get in touch with this power, whatever it is, you know, I need it. And so I, you know, worked the steps and I wasn't free after step four. I'm like, what is this? This sucks. Step nine. Finally, I'm walking back to sober living. The sun is shining. Kind of reminds me of how my friend Brooke describes her spiritual experience. It was like, and I'm so grateful that everyone's here. I like, I'm I, like, I feel so loved talking about the fellowship. It's like people will show up and actually like love me and like want to hear me talk. But, um, I don't talk very much otherwise. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> but, um, but I just, um, fellowship. Yeah. So it was carrying me through. And then at ninth step, like I had this, this, like the sun was shining. I remember it because it was a spiritual awakening, you know? And all of a sudden this thought came into my mind. It seemed so simple that I never had to drink again. And like for an alcoholic of my type, whose only solution was to get drunk or to have a drink in my body to be okay. I was blown away. It was just like this subtle thought that just like outweighed all else. And I was like, wow, you know, and I went ahead and I, um, talked about that spiritual experience. It was amazing, but that's all I talked about for like the next 10 years of my sobriety. (laughs) I don't think I thoroughly did step 11. I think I did prayer and meditation for like two weeks. And I was like, oh yeah, that's really good. I kind of felt a connection. Things were flowing better, but it was two weeks. And that was in sober living. Step 12, you know, I didn't really know my life depended on working with others. I kind of thought like I could kind of work with others and try my best but I didn't really even have the knowledge or the steps, like how they worked or how I actually stayed sober. I'm just like, yeah, just go to meetings and like make a list of, you know, put your powerless over, blah, blah, blah. And I'm still sweating. <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> it's like, God is like, your ego is going to be down. You're like a sweaty mess up there. So anyways, um, I worked the steps. I got, a, you know, I got free. Oh, 10 minutes. Yay. Oh my God, I didn't even get into like, okay, so this is my spiritual awakening. I stayed sober, you know, and I worked the steps and I didn't know what the steps were doing, but they were getting like all of that stuff that was blocking me from power. They were, you know, blocking me from that power. So the steps are really important because they got me unblocked and I didn't really know what this power was or how it was going to work. But I could tell you that when I did the steps, power flew through and flowed through. And I had power to no longer drink, and I no longer wanted to drink. I was restored to sanity in mind. The book says, like, when the spiritual malady is overcome, we straighten out mentally and physically. And, like, that was true for me. And so I was blown away. So I kind of went on that spiritual experience for the next 10 years of my sobriety. I got married. I met my husband working at Denny's. I'm still living in sober living. I'm a year and a half. So I'm like, okay, I'm past the year. I'm good. So I go out and I get married. Actually, I got pregnant first. Then I got married. (laughs) Because I was too afraid. At that time, I was driven by fear. I possibly couldn't, you know, take care of myself. I didn't know how. So I just moved in with uh, this guy and we stayed married for now 13 years and we're, um, have a, you know, divorce coming up because, um, it's just not working. And I used to stay in stuff that didn't work. Like my dynamic with my mother, like I stayed in that. I stayed connected to her. I let her talk to me on the phone and like all of the sickness, like from New Mexico out here, I listened to it for years and I let her like dominate me as an adult, you know? And then finally, like with some therapy, I was like, able to create boundaries and I don't talk to her today and it doesn't and I love my mother like I love her so much but I don't talk to her today because she can't you know treat me the way a person treats another person and it's not her fault she doesn't want to hurt me but she's probably full of fear like I was before I learned how to like relate to people and today like um so I had a lot of chaos, you know, eating disorder flared up I was beyond human aid eight years of my sobriety I spent like going in and out of uh psych words and not every day, but you know, there's like a few, there's, there was a few trips cause I was suicidal because I had this other, you know, disease going on with my, with my, um, alcoholism that I, and I felt horrible because I'm showing up to AA. I didn't want to take my cakes for years cause I was so tormented by this. And I, and by this time I have a little boy, I'm throwing up in front of him. I'm, 
I'm just, I'm devastated, you know, and that's when I really learned what it is to be beyond human aid and to be powerless because up until that point, I just heard mothers talk about, you know, the trauma and the hurt that they put their kids through. And that wasn't my story because I got sober at 23, but now it's part of my story, you know, and I could not stop for this little kid. He was so cute, like in his little, little sleepers and stuff. And I, and I couldn't stop and it was breaking my heart. And, and this went on for eight years of his life. I had relapsed into my bulimia when he was a year and a half. And I said, by the time he's two, I'll be done. So I finally got free of that eating disorder when he was 10. So, um, you know, there's a lot of pain, you know, in my, in my recovery process. But, you know, I didn't have to pick up a drink over that. But, I mean, I honestly didn't need a drink during that time because I was also using men. I was also using the food, bulimia. My life was chaotic. And I can tell you it's because I don't know why it is, but it, I was not – I didn't understand what I was suffering from. Today I do. And – I learned that, you know, from my home group, and I went through the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I had an experience with it. It was no longer, I used to read the big book to fall asleep, and and when someone whipped it out at a meeting, I was like, oh my God, like, I just want to hear another story about like a cat or something, you know, or like whatever people talk about when they're not talking about the steps. You know, I wanted to hear that stuff, because that's more exciting. So I was just like, finally, I went through the book, and I, and I realized, you know, that what I was suffering from, I'm suffering from this like spiritual malady. And that's drunk or sober. Like, it's the second part of step one. My life is unmanageable. That I like to, yeah. And that's drunk or sober. And I'm like, oh, okay. Because I was looking at all the unmanageability as a result of my drinking. And that was clear. Now I get sober. Now I don't have all that stuff happening. So it seems like I have it together. So I'm not doing step 12 consistently. I'm not doing step 11. So I succumbed into this dark place with this eating disorder. And then I learned what the solution is. So I have the knowledge, but I still can't apply it. So I'm like, I'm screwed. So finally, I just had a, I really needed to just rely on the steps and I needed to go through the steps again in an eating disorder, you know, acting out, having no power until I got power. And I got power by working with another woman because she called me and she said, and she was severely bulimic and I thought she was going to die. So when I got off the phone with her, I was like, oh my God, she's going to die. And the second thought that came to me was like, you're going to die. And like from there moment, it went from like my head to my heart. And that was another spiritual awakening I had. And coincidentally, I was in the steps again, you know, so spiritual awakening as a result of the 12 steps, is like a real thing. <laughs> so I you know I haven't had that bulimia come back except for like one time and I'm not afraid of it anymore. I'm recovered and I stay recovered today because I, I learned that. So I'm taking my body to the fellowship, right? So I can't stop body to the fellowship, carrying me through. My mind is sick. My mind, the problem is in my mind because if, I know I can't drink, so obviously don't drink, but it, the time and place always comes with them without defense. I can't rely on my mind. I can't remember the drink or remember the, my last drunk. I, I, I don't even know what it was. Who cares? You know what I mean? But I know that I have been restored to sanity by a higher power because if I couldn't remember like the last night of humiliation, how am I going to remember like 15 years ago? Oh, that was horrible. I better not do that again. You know, like it's not going to work. So I just... Stuck with the program, and I did what I knew. I brought my body to the fellowship, another fellowship. You know, I went through the steps, and I really learned about step 11, prayer and meditation. And and that saved my life because I couldn't stop. So if, like, you can't stop drinking or whatever, like, I mean, I started doing step 11, like, while I was still in my eating disorder and my other addiction. I sat in the morning, and I opened the pages 88, and I read 83 through 88 in the morning, and I did a quiet meditation, and I begged for help and asked for direction. And I had all these ideas of what I needed to do to fix it. And I, I didn't know. So, I mean, that was actually blocking me from getting free for eight years because I thought I knew how my recovery was supposed to look. So I realized later in sobriety that I, I had a lot of, um, and I had a lot of extramarital affairs while I was in this addiction. So there was a lot of trauma done in my marriage. I tried to leave my marriage. I was actually like getting on websites and getting paid for, I guess I'd call that prostitution, but I thought it was like a sugar daddy, you know, I don't know. We were going to the movies sometimes, you know, but I did get $500, but we did see a movie. We went to IMAX, you know, it was kind of romantic. Um, not really. It was horrible. I was like, can we just get this? Anyways, so <laughs> I'm like, I don't even like this movie, <laughs> okay. but anyways, yeah, so that's part of my story. It was horrific, you know, and basically... That's why I'm so on fire for this program today, because I know that spiritual malady drives that mental obsession. So the, the 12 steps treat that mental obsession. You know, that's, that's, that's the solution. It gets, me, it gets me in touch with the power, like the power of God. You know, like the God that we talk about in the steps in the book, that God. You know, whatever that God is to you, it's, it's one power, like just with a lot of names possibly. I don't know. And so, but I know that it works and it flows through me and it's restored me to sanity and it's given me a life. I don't want to... It has given me a life beyond my wildest dreams. My friends are like, probably like, whoa, are you sure? Because <laughs> I'm going through a bunch of chaos now in sobriety, you know, self-made chaos. I thought, you know, whatever, <laughs> I made a mistake. <laughs> but um, let's see. 
And that's a good thing, too, that I've learned in sobriety. So the um, spiritual malady is driving this mental obsession. It's like the engine for it, that restless discontent. And on page 52 of the big book, it talks about the bedevilments, like prey to misery and depression. So that's like a spot check in my sobriety. Like, is that how I'm living? Like, can I, do I seem to not really be able to make a living? And not like a financial living, just like a life worth living. Like, do I wake up and the first word out of my mouth is like the F word? Yes, that was me. And like, I wanted to die. I was hoping like a semi would hit me on the way to my job at Kaiser. <laughs> and so, <laughs> so yeah, I, I would say I was bedeviled for quite a time in my sobriety. And I didn't know that I was suffering from a spiritual malady because I go to meetings, you know, I talk about sobriety. I talk about that ninth step, you know, spiritual awakening. I tell people there's hope, but I'm living in this, like this way. And I, and I, and I don't know what's going on until I heard someone talk about the bedevilments. And then I really got into the step work because that's the solution to get me in touch with the power. And 12 step work now is the only thing that treats that spiritual malady, like picking up chairs, my secretary commitment, all useful to the fellowship. Cause obviously how would it run if no one put out the chairs? <laughs> but, um, that's not going to feed my spirit. I have this spiritual malady, which is if it's not, if it's left untreated, the life I was living, prostitution, lies, cheating, like throwing up in front of my son, neglecting him. That's, that's my truth. That's, that's what happens when I'm not connected to God. So I'm really excited to like do the steps every morning. I'm like, please, you know, I never want to go back to that. And I don't have to, I could stay sober for good and for all. It's not like one day at a time. I don't know if I'm going to drink tomorrow. I'm pretty freaking certain I'm not going to drink tomorrow, you know? And like, that means that I have to stay in constant contact with this God and a minute. I can't believe I talked for 45 minutes. I didn't even get into my like recent chaos, which is probably God saying like, shut your mouth. <laughs> I, I was like, darn it. That was a really good story too. <laughs> but no, no, not. Uh, it's too, it's too, it's too fresh. I'm actually like devastated. But, um, <laughs> and here I am laughing about it. It's because I know like this shit can happen in sobriety and I no longer have to stand up here and say, Hey, I'm perfect. You know, I have your solution and I have all my shit together. I could get up here and I could be real and say that I'm afraid. Like there's a lot of unknowns. Like I really just screwed up, but you know, it all like is bringing me closer to truth. And if I don't see that truth where I need God, like I usually see it through pain. It's not when I'm like doing really good that I'm like, Oh, I think I really need to grow spiritually in this area. No, it's like through immense pain, just like it was when I was done drinking, you know, like that pain is what like pushed me through and the fellowship gave me the power until I got that power in step two, I get a little bit of power to go on to three and then four through nine, like just does like, I don't know. It just, it does, it clears away all that stuff and I'm not driven by fear anymore. And so I get to see today which fears are still driving me, and I have a solution today, and that solution is God. And, like, this is the only way I know how to get in touch with that power through step 11. So I seek this power a lot because, I, like I said, on my own power, I, I don't like it. It's very uncomfortable. So, I mean, I have a lot of unknowns today, and I'm not driven by fear. Like, I know I'm safe and protected. And I know that because I've been through worse stuff before. You know what I mean? And like, there's always a plan. And each step of the way, God is showing me, like, I have you. Like, I had a devastation over here. And then what am I going to do? And then I get like this, 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 you know, money. <laughs> like, and I'm just like, okay, God, like, God had told me in meditation that he was going to take care of me if I stepped out of this marriage. He said, you're going to get that money. You're going to be okay. And that was just like in my head. I don't have like, you know, a voice coming into my home or anything like that. <laughs> but it was just like this intuitive thought. And so that's where I am today. I get intuitive thoughts and like they, and I, and I trust it and I take care of it. I mean, I don't take care of it. I get taken care of. You don't want me to take care of anything. So I do take care of my sobriety. I do take action where I have power. I bring my body to the fellowship. I bring my mind to the steps and I bring my spiritual malady through working with others, you know, so I don't have to feel that way. I don't have to feel restless, irritable, discontent. I'm not prey to misery and depression. I could suffer. I could have, you know, days of depression, but I'm not, I'm not, you know, I'm not driven by fear. And so, I mean, and I could be at peace with where I'm at and I could walk through things, not always with dignity and grace, you know, <laughs> and, but you know, it's okay. Like I had all these ideas, like a real woman like has to be recovered and like do everything. Like they act sane when relationships go bad and a real woman like who's recovered 15 years knows better. And it's like, no, actually I don't. <laughs> and so I'm learning along the way. And like what I have right now is like good enough. And God is like my solution. And like with God, I'm not going to fail and I'm going to continue to grow and stay sober for hopefully the rest of my life. Thanks. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.